Good morning, Carson Bible Church. Happy Resurrection Sunday. He is risen just as he said he would. We have much to celebrate. If you would, take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 24 with me. We're going to be working through verses 36 through 49 this morning. Why don't you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, we rejoice at the resurrection of your Son, Jesus. We rejoice to know that death had no authority over him, that he went to the cross in our place for our sin, and yet, in giving up his life, even the grave could not contain him, and that he has risen to eternal life, which brings us the promise of eternal life as well. God, we love you and we praise you. And we pray that you would be glorified by our time this morning. In Jesus' name, our Savior, amen. Well, if you have your Bibles open to Luke chapter 24, I'm going to read through our passage starting in verse 36. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit, and he said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Well, this passage uh, is sort of the conclusion to uh, Luke's account of the Gospel, and then it's also the transition into Volume 2 of Luke's work, which is uh, what we call the Book of Acts. And um, this has... Jesus appearing to his disciples in this room. You see, that they had already gone to the tomb where they expected to find him, and yet here he is appearing in a room where they never expected him to be. This is right after uh, the occurrence of uh, Jesus appearing to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. We worked through that on uh, last week. Uh, during our communion time, and uh, it actually seems to be right in the middle of that conversation as those disciples uh, made their way into Jerusalem to meet up with the other disciples, and they tell everything that had happened on the road. Uh, verse 36 says, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them. They're mid-conversation about Jesus appearing to them when Jesus appears to them. And here's what he says, peace to you. Now, that is a very typical Jewish greeting, but I think there's actually more going on here. You see, the risen Christ brings peace to troubled hearts. Jesus appears among them and he says, peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. Why might Jesus need to speak peace to his disciples in a moment like this? Certainly, they're alarmed to see him be alive from the dead. But why might someone come back from the dead? For revenge, right? Someone who had been betrayed, someone who was innocent and who was brutally executed, as a criminal, if they come back from the dead, your first thought might be that they are here for revenge, 
right? Revenge on those who betrayed him. Revenge upon those failed disciples who scattered when Jesus was being crucified. Revenge on Peter who denied him. What if Jesus is back to get back at everyone who failed him? What if now is the time for judgment and overthrowing his enemies? But Jesus assures them that he's not there for revenge. He assures them that he has come in peace. Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. They're troubled, they're scared, they think that he's a ghost. And see, the question for them isn't really, has Jesus really risen from the dead? They already have the report of the empty tomb from the women. They already have a report of Jesus appearing to Simon. They already have the report of these two disciples who are on the road to Emmaus. They know that Jesus is no longer in the grave. The question for them is, here's this person who has appeared among us and looks just like Jesus and sounds just like Jesus. The question is, is it really him? Is he a ghost? Is it a hologram? Is it CGI? But Jesus is patient with them to bring peace to their troubled hearts. He's patient with their doubts and their fears. And he says, see my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Verse 40, and when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. See, Jesus allows his body to be examined by his troubled disciples to prove that it really is him, that it's not just an image, that it's not a ghost. Jesus shows that while his body is different, in some ways it's still the same. He shows them that he can eat this piece of fish, and that is proof to them that he is still a body of flesh and not a ghost, because ghosts don't eat. He's proving to them that it's really him. He's patient with their doubts and their fears, and he allows himself to be examined and tested to prove it. Now, his body is different though. He has a body that is made for eternity now. Because we don't know how it is that he appeared in this room. Other accounts of the gospel say that the doors were locked in this room and somehow he came through a wall or a door or just materialized there. Luke doesn't quite tell us that. But they do seem very alarmed that he has just appeared here. So something is different about his body. So imagine that you have a kitchen knife, for example, that's made out of iron. And iron is durable, and it can be sharpened, and it can be used for the purpose of cutting meat, fruit, vegetables, whatever you might need to cut in the kitchen. And if you were to replace that iron knife, because it's susceptible to rust, that iron knife after being exposed to water, will eventually rust and decay, and it will no longer be suitable for the purpose it was intended for. So if you were to replace it 
with a knife made of another material, something lighter or less durable or less strong like paper or plastic wouldn't suffice. But something like stainless steel would. It could have the same appearance as the kitchen knife. It could serve the same function, be just as durable, can be sharpened, and yet it's not susceptible to rust and decay. And that's sort of what Jesus' eternity body is like. It can perform the same functions, and yet it's not susceptible to decay or death or disease. It's made for eternity. Jesus allows them to examine this eternity body to see that it really is Him. Now, if we believe Paul's theology, what is the body of Christ today? It's the church, isn't it? We are the body of Christ. And what if Jesus still allows his body to be examined and tested to prove that it's really him? And not just some hollow image of him. Of course, as the church, we don't like to be examined and tested, do we? As the church, we want to be left alone. But maybe our responses would change a little bit to skeptics, to those who would examine and test the church. What if we thought of it in those terms? What if we thought of trials and tribulations and difficulty for the church as just doubters and skeptics examining to see if this is really Christ? Maybe we would be a little bit more patient and maybe we would be a little bit more understanding. Maybe the church should be a place for doubters and skeptics. Maybe we should consider how welcoming we are of doubters and skeptics. And do we invite them in and do we invite them to poke and prod around and test to see if Christ is really in this? Maybe we should. Especially when we're talking about things like resurrection, a man rising from the grave as something core to what we believe as Christians. Maybe we should be a little more patient with doubters and skeptics. Luke says that they doubted for joy, which is an interesting way to phrase something. Verse 41, it says, while they still disbelieved for joy. And what might that be about? That's a strange emotion, isn't it? To disbelieve for joy? Well, it means that it was too good to be true. I asked my kids if they'd ever experienced something that was too good to be true. That they thought they might be dreaming instead of knowing that this was reality. My daughter, for most of her life, has been very obsessed with bunnies, and for her seventh birthday, we let her get a pet bunny. We surprised her, we took her to uh, an adoption center, and she chose out a bunny. And she said that that day just seemed too good to be true. She couldn't believe it. She thought she was dreaming to be able to get a pet bunny of her own. My son, this year, for his fifth birthday, we took him to a place called The Bounce Place, which is basically just a store in the mall that's filled with bounce houses. 
We let him invite some of his little friends and uh, we surprised him with a trip to the bounce place. And he said that that was too good to be true. When he walked in the door to the bounce place, he thought he was dreaming. You know, if bunnies in bounce places can seem unreal to us because of how elated and joyful they make us, imagine the one that we have followed and modeled our lives after, the one true Son of God, and having seen Him be executed and then to see Him alive again. See, the resurrection really just preaches itself. You guys don't need me to preach to you. The truth is enough that Christ has risen from the dead. But you guys know that I make it a point not to criticize other pastors and preachers. I do my best not to criticize or throw anybody under the bus, but I feel like I should tell you that there is a celebrity pastor who has felt that this year he needs to spruce up Easter. This year, because of what the world is going through in the middle of a pandemic, that people are in despair, people are fearful, people are saddened, and we need to spruce up Easter. And so he's going to have a number of big name celebrities on stage with him. And there's going to be a lot of powerful entertainment in that church on this Resurrection Sunday. But isn't that such a strange thought? Isn't that such an odd view that we need to spruce up Easter? What more could we add? The Son of God, the Messiah, brutally, unfairly executed on a criminal's cross and is now risen from the dead. How do you spruce that up? I think this pastor is right in that what the world is experiencing has caused de despair and depression and fear and anxiety. I don't think that entertainment is what we need in the midst of that. What are we fearful of? What are we anxious about? Isn't it death? In the middle of a pandemic, isn't that what we're afraid of? Is that we or a family member, a loved one, a friend might die. We don't need to be entertained in the midst of this. We need a savior who can overcome death. There is no way to spruce up Easter. Let's move on. Verse 44, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. See, not only does the risen Christ bring peace to troubled hearts, but the risen Christ brings understanding to ancient scripture. Right? The church might be tested and examined to see if Christ is really in this, but ultimately the truth is found in the scripture and the church should always be pointing doubters and skeptics back to the truth of scripture. 
Jesus said, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. Jesus reminds them of everything that he taught them during the years of his ministry. And he reminds them that all of what we call the Old Testament, he says here, the Law of Moses, the Prophets and Psalms, must be fulfilled. And all of those scriptures find their fulfillment in Christ. And this is much like Jesus' conversation with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, isn't it? He explained to them how all of the Old Testament scriptures were about him and how he was fulfilling it. And Luke is typically pretty detailed. And yet here, when Jesus is explaining himself through the Old Testament to his disciples, he's surprisingly short on details. Now, why might that be? What do you think the point is here? Don't you wish that Luke gave us a good five or six chapters, maybe more, of Jesus' commentary on all of the Old Testament and showing how it points to him? Here's what I think God and Luke want you to do with a passage like this. We should start asking ourselves, well, wait a minute, where does the Old Testament talk about a risen Messiah? Where does the Old Testament talk about resurrection? And so you might think back to yourself, well, doesn't Ezekiel say something about a valley of dry bones and then they, God brings them back into life and, and reforms them? And so then you'll go back and you'll study Ezekiel. And then you'll think to yourself, and doesn't Daniel say something about that all the dead will be raised and some to punishment, some to eternal life, and so you'll go back and you'll study Daniel, and you'll find Christ in Daniel. And you'll think to yourself, didn't Job say something about, uh, though my flesh be destroyed, that yet with my eyes I will see God? So you'll go back and you'll read and you'll study Job with new eyes, seeing Christ in that Old Testament text, and you'll Think to yourself, and isn't there a psalm that says something about you will not let your Holy One see corruption? And so you go back and you study the psalms. I think that's why Luke is short on details here. Jesus has told his disciples that all of the Old Testament is about him. And you should be left with a lot of questions about that, which should drive you to go study your Bible with new enlightened eyes and see Christ in all of Scripture. Jesus continues, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Not only does the risen Christ bring peace to troubled hearts, not only does the risen Christ bring understanding to ancient scripture, but the risen Christ brings boldness to timid disciples. Jesus outlines exactly what the gospel is, is that there is forgiveness of sin to those who are repentant, and that that should be proclaimed beginning from Jerusalem and going out into all of the world. As you read volume two of Luke's work, the book of Acts, and as you read what was being preached by the Apostles, it's the resurrection of Christ. That is largely what they're preaching, is that Christ is risen. We see that 
most of the apostles will go on to be martyred for the name of Christ, for the preaching of the gospel? And why is it those disciples who at the cross scattered in fear then later are willing to give up their lives for the gospel of this same Jesus? Well, it's because he rose from the dead. Jesus rose from the grave and gave a great boldness to these timid disciples to preach the truth of the gospel. Jesus also says, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Luke's account doesn't specify what that promise of the Father was, but in John chapter 20, we're told very clearly that it's the Holy Spirit. In fact, this afternoon, while you're home with your families, you should read John chapter 20 together as a family. The risen Christ and the Holy Spirit take these timid, troubled, and fearful disciples and turn them into bold preachers to establish the church and alter the course of history of all of humanity. What's so important about Resurrection Sunday is that the risen Christ brings peace to troubled hearts, brings understanding to ancient scripture, and brings boldness to timid disciples. Why don't you pray with me? Father God, we certainly are sometimes fearful and troubled. And sometimes we have a hard time believing that all this could be really true. It seems too good to be true. Father God, sometimes we have a hard time understanding the Old Testament. Father God, sometimes we are very timid disciples. God, through your Holy Spirit, we ask that you would bring peace to our hearts when we're troubled, that you would enlighten our hearts and minds to understand Scripture and see Christ in all of your word, and that your Holy Spirit would embolden us to preach this gospel of repentance and forgiveness of sin, that we would be patient with skeptics, that we would be willing to prove that as the church this is truly Christ's body, and that we would share this message where we're at now and around the world, that Christ indeed is risen from the dead. In his name we pray.